Hello and welcome to this conversation on the war in Ukraine. I'm Sam Rogovin, Director of the International Security Program at the Lowy Institute. My guest today is Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, who is a non-resident fellow of the Lowy Institute and Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College, London. Among many distinguished appointments, he was official historian of the Falklands campaign, and in 2009, he served as a member of the official inquiry into Britain and the 2003 Iraq war. In November last year, Laurie Friedman published his Lowy Institute paper, Modern Warfare, Lessons from Ukraine. He has written on international history, strategic theory, and nuclear weapons. Among his recent books are Strategy, A History in 2013, The Future of War, A History in 2017, and Command, The Politics of Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine in 2022. Laurie's Substack newsletter, Comment is Freed, remains compulsory reading for those following the Ukraine war. So Lawrence Friedman, welcome back to the Lowy Institute. And let me begin by asking you a perhaps naive or simplistic question, the same one I asked you when we last spoke in November of, uh, of last year about the war in Ukraine, and that is, who is winning? Um, the simple answer is nobody. Um, neither Ukraine nor Russia has a, a simple path, a straightforward path to military victory. The more complex answer is that there's a different war going on in different ways. So it's sort of deadlocked on the land. Um, Ukraine has achieved a sort of victory at sea, which doesn't necessarily affect the end of the war, but is quite a blow to Russia. Uh, on the other hand, Russia um, threatens Ukraine quite severely um, with attacks on its infrastructure. So the, there's there's lots there's different wars going on at the same time. And I guess the final point is that how this war ends probably doesn't depend simply on uh, success on, in battle. That may well be a part of it, but it's a political decision uh, uh, about what you're prepared to accept to bring this to a close. So I, I gather from your recent writing that you are just as pessimistic about the likelihood of a cessation of hostilities as you were when your book was published in November of last year. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, my view on that hasn't changed, and certainly nothing's happened in the interim uh, to suggest that the, the differences between the two sides can easily be reconciled. Ukraine wants its territory back. Russia wants to take more of it. Uh, so it's uh, if it, on, terri on territory, there's no obvious place with which to stop. Uh, Russia will have to withdraw forces. I don't think anybody's going to expect Ukraine uh, to make peace on the basis of the existing occupation. You can imagine Ukraine ceding some territory, but not as much as Russia has got at the moment. And I think there's still a difficulty for Putin to end the war without getting his, his more maximalist objectives. On the other hand, the, the stirrings at the moment, the Ukrainian foreign ministers in China, we, uh, and, and China is uh, is still careful not to wholly align itself with, with Putin's goals. Both sides have been talking more about peace recently. It's just when you look behind what they're saying, they're, they're talking about quite different things. So... One way to end the war, of course, is for one side or the other, or perhaps both sides, to redefine what they mean by victory. Does that look like happening? It doesn't look like happening at the moment, but you're right. Um, I think if we go back to uh, early days of the war, when the major diplomatic effort was underway, and the two sides were actually talking to each other, I think you, you, you see different aspects to a deal. Um, then the focus was on this question of neutrality. And I'm sure Russia is still keen uh, to keep Ukraine out of NATO. The difficulty that was faced then is, uh, in return for that, Ukraine wants something pretty much similar to what NATO offers. That, that is uh, as good a security guarantee as you can get, particularly one backed by the United States. Uh, and as we know, now know from the reporting 
that has been done on what actually happened at these negotiations. They were sort of moving along on that basis until Russia said that everybody who signed up to this question uh, of security guarantees in the end would be subject to a Russian veto, uh, which clearly wasn't going to be a runner. So you, you've got to work out how, how do you bring in the whole question of security arrangements? Can you reframe the security arrangements in a much wider context? Uh, secondly, you've got Crimea. Uh, the big difference uh, over the last couple of years is that Crimea looks increasingly unsafe for Russia. Uh, Ukraine has been able to attack many of the military installations uh, in, in Crimea. And this has caused real problems for Russia. It's had to withdraw its, its fleet for, uh, from Sevastopol for much of the time. Uh, its air defences have taken a battering in, in Crimea. Aircraft have been attacked in Crimea. And this is a problem for Russia. So Russia is going to be looking for guarantees about Crimea. Uh, but why should Ukraine offer them as far as Ukraine is concerned? It's hitting its own uh, occupation forces in its own territory. Then you've got the question of eastern and southern Ukraine. Ukraine's got, um, Russia is occupying bits, large bits in some cases, of four provinces. Um, but Putin's most latest latest demand, only a couple of months ago, was that for a peace, Ukraine has to agree to give all of those province, provinces to Russia, which clearly is, is a complete non-starter. So again, Russia needs to uh, go back to at the very least, and even then this will be difficult, to, to the starting points of the uh, of its campaign, which was Donetsk and Luhansk, where, where the enclaves were, which they claimed were, uh, incorrectly claimed, were, were under great threat. And then lastly, you've got a whole series of new issues, uh, particularly from the Ukrainian side of reparations for all the damage that's been done to the country, uh, prosecution of war crimes, uh, uh, which are with the ICC and so on at the moment. So, uh, and once you bring those things in, it becomes harder. And then, of course, Russia will want sanctions lifted. Put all that together, you've got a heck of a, an agenda, much of which won't go anywhere, but some of it has to if you're going to get any breakthroughs, or else you just have a simple ceasefire, more or less where you stand, uh, which is very difficult for Ukraine to accept. And actually isn't particularly useful for Russia because it means they're stuck with depopulated, battered territory um, full of partisans who, who will make life difficult for them and a, and a very long border to defend while Ukraine goes more and more towards NATO. So when you put, when you start going through the issues, um, you, you, you can see just how difficult it is to, to, to reconcile all of this. It doesn't mean to say something will happen. Or, um, the pressure is is there, and both sides are undoubtedly tired of war. But it, but it's uh, but having been through all of this, it's quite a thing to admit that actually it wasn't worth fighting for. So just narrowly on this question of security guarantees, Laurie, I, I, re I recognise you, you've laid out a, a host of reasons why uh, any kind of uh, cessation of the conflict is unlikely, and and the 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 security guarantees problem, the distinction that the uh, the difference that the Ukrainians and the Russians have on that is only one. But let me just ask one perhaps slightly devil's advocate question on, on that. Why are the security guarantees so important? When you consider, it seems to me, if this war has proved anything, it is the, the idea of so-called defensive dominance, which is that it is incredibly difficult and costly to seize and hold territory, but it is far easier and cheaper to defend territory from assault. Uh, both sides have now illustrated that throughout this war. So if, if the Ukrainians are armed and trained properly, why do they necessarily need these security guarantees? Why can't they, again, if they're armed and trained properly, uh, defend themselves indefinitely against the Russians? Well, I think they'll, they'll, they'll want to be armed and trained properly as well, uh, because you can't rely on security guarantees, as they've already discovered, um, because they thought they had some after they'd given up nuclear weapons in 1994. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, uh, and because you can't rely on security guarantees anyway, you can argue why I make the first. The difficulty Ukraine's got is it wants to do other things. It wants to reconstruct it, 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 its uh, 
its budget's under enormous strain. It wants to grow its economy again. It's got quite a lot, a tremendous amount of economic potential if it can get unlocked. Um, and uh, if there's just a ceasefire while it's trying to arm itself to the teeth again, so can Russia. And Russia still will have advantages, and air power in particular. Uh, so that the next round might be harder, might just work out differently. So I think security guarantees are important to Ukraine. Then they can't be the whole story, and, were, and everybody knows, like most guarantees, you've got to read the small print. But the, all that being said, uh, I think having been through what they've been through, the, 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 they'd like to think that they could just become a normal country. Uh, and that, I think, means becoming part, in many ways, of the European family much more. Uh, Russia doesn't object, though this was the start of the whole business in 2013, to Ukraine becoming uh, a member of the EU. Um, but uh, uh, in, the EU doesn't provide the military support that uh, that the US with NATO will do. So uh, it... it the language can be found in all of these things, but you, but I think the idea of just Ukraine being stuck in a permanent arms race with mm -hmm. with Russia it is a bit depressing. Nevertheless, is it fair to conclude, Laurie, that the when the fighting eventually ends, on whatever terms, the future for Ukraine is that it it becomes whether it's part of a, a part of NATO or some other kind of security guarantee that Ukraine will have to become a kind of garrison state, like Finland or Israel? Yes. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, a combination of the two in some way. And, and the Israel model, which, as we've seen, has got its limitations, is, um, uh, is one that was talked about uh, from early on. It, Ukraine has now got a pretty uh, snappy defence industry, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a genuine innovator in some uh, types of equipment, particularly drones. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, 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 that was, it's not going to go away. But it's a question of balance, and you don't want to live your life on the edge all the time, which is what, what could happen. And a lot depends on what's going on in Russia as well. I mean, you know, we, 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 Putin has created this sort of uh, autocratic, paranoid state um that is actually going to be uh in deep trouble in many ways I mean, the the, the uh, economy looks good at the moment but it's very dependent upon uh oil prices but it's also investing crazily in in stuff which is immediately destroyed uh in a war economy and not investing at all on the on the civilian side inflation high, interest rates high labor shortage there are big issues that have to be addressed in russia but we don't know how that will happen and, and it's it, you know and any attempt by by the west to say this is what should or will happen in russia is almost invariably going to to, to look foolish so you know we just have to we have to wait and see on that but that would that would make a difference it is possible to get over all of Larry, we're all obsessed with U.S. politics at the moment, more more than ever. Um, more just, than ever. Ju just, just assume uh, the worst for the Ukrainians right now: uh, that that Trump wins and that U.S. military aid to Ukraine stops dead in January 2025 under Trump. What happens to the war after that? What happens to Ukraine? Well, first, I don't, th I don't think even if Trump wins, that's likely. Uh, no. uh, 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 and I, well, let me just explain why I don't think it's thinking what, what could happen. Trump, what Trump has said is he's got a way of ending the war. Um, well, I've given reasons why he may find that harder, but he, he has leverage that other people wouldn't have. Uh, he can uh, cut back on Ukraine. Uh, he can um, increase support for Ukraine. And if you look at the sort of plan that's come up from people associated with his previous administration, it involves sort of coercion in both directions. Uh, brings Zelensky to the table with a threat, uh, force Putin to make concessions with a threat. Uh, but I think having seen what Afghanistan did to Biden by the sort of hasty withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan, I think Putin, uh, Trump would be wary of being associated. And I think the best comparison to make is with Mike Johnson, who was Speaker of the House, who for months sat on his hands uh, and refused to bring the supplemental bill 
to the floor of the House and eventually realized that his legacy was going to be the defeat of Ukraine. Um, and, he, and he couldn't quite bring himself to do that. In fact, has turned around and now sort of quite a vocal advocate. Um, and of course, he did that with Trump's blessing. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that works out. But what happened for that, and, and this is since what happened after the publication of my paper uh, for you, was uh, the money ran out uh, and Ukraine was not getting support. And it was very difficult. I mean, we, we saw what happened. They were outgunned. Part of it was their own problems because they hadn't sorted out their mobilization, which they're now sorting out. Uh, but they hadn't sorted that out, so they were outmanned as well. Uh, and they lost ground. Uh, they didn't lose as much ground as I thought they would, to be honest. Uh, they're still losing a bit of ground. Uh, but there hasn't been a massive Russian breakthrough, which many were expecting, and I certainly feared. Um, but it was very hard and getting harder for the Ukrainians uh, in, the first, in the first four or five months of this year as a result of that. The Ukrainians will fight. I don't have in my mind. I don't have any doubt. The U U Europeans are still going to keep on supporting. I would have thought Biden would have a legacy support uh, if he can get it through to Ukraine. That, that, that will give him some more to be going on with until Trump works out what he, he's doing. If it is indeed Trump, which looks a bit less likely now than it did before. Um, so. It's, uh, it'll be difficult, but you know, there's no point in pretending that the, the, the Europeans can fill all the gaps. It'll be very difficult. But the problem for, for Putin in the end is um, all, you know, all that he takes from Ukraine in, in the last two and a half years has been taken largely by destroying it. Um, it, uh, it, it, it there's nothing much left. If you look at all, all these places that we came to, you know, we followed. Mm. Back with Avdivka, Sever, the Nestles, Canalta, and so on. They're, they're just shells now. Yeah. And um, it, it, this isn't really a hearts and minds campaign. And if he, and the further he pushes, the more he's going to find um, different forms of resistance. And eventually, the whole of the Russian army is going to have to be spent occupying uh, a hostile country. And you know, this, to me, was the problem with. with uh, Putin's whole project right from the start. Uh, that's why I was more skeptically do the thing in the first place. But it, and that problem hasn't gone away. That's actually the reason why, deep down, I think that they still would like to at least occupy Kiev. At least that would be, you know, so there isn't a, a Ukrainian government um, pushing against them. So um, uh, the, 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 the answer is it'll carry on, but with Ukraine at a, at a disadvantage. Now, you're, that, that point you just made, Laurie, about uh, the destruction of those cities that the Russians have gone on to occupy raises a broader question I wanted to talk about, about the conduct of the war. Your latest Substack yeah. essay restates a point you made in your book, which is that Russia's attacks on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure are unlikely to work ultimately. There's plenty of history to back up your claim, for instance, the German blitz on uh, British cities in World War II, which merely stiffened resolve in the UK. Uh, it seems like there's a similar dynamic happening in uh, Ukraine at the moment. In that light, however, what should we make of the regular calls from commentators and some politicians for Western capitals to loosen the shackles on long-range weapons transfers to Ukraine? Or for that matter, to lift the restrictions on how Ukraine can use uh, long-range weapons like the Storm Shadow cruise missile, which the Ukrainians are currently barred from using to hit targets in Russia. Yeah, um, there's two issues. First, it's true that, that um, it's unlikely that attacks on Ukrainian infrastructure will force Ukraine to sort of beg for mercy. It, it is, however, the case it is extremely unpleasant and difficult for Ukraine. Um, people die in these attacks, hospitals are hit, um, there's blackouts most of the time, a lot of the time, and they've restored remarkably quite a bit of the electricity that's been knocked out, um, but we're still very underpowered, and it's not winter yet, and there's generators and so on that could make the difference, but there's a real problem. So though it's true that we may not win the war for, for, for Russia, it really hurts. And um, 
uh, it'd been in some ways the most effective part of the Russian campaign mm. uh, because uh, you have air defences, uh, but you need a, a lot of air defences. Uh, I think you know, it was described as putting a, a single duvet on a double bed. You know, you, the, 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 there's always gaps and there's always places that they can come through. So you've got that problem. Now, the the question of being able to hit targets in Russia has been sort of a neuralgic issue, particularly for the US, right from the start. My own view is, you know, you could understand it if you thought that Ukraine was going to try to do to to Russia what Russia is doing to Ukraine and, and send um, and, and have regular attacks on, on civilian residential areas, say in Moscow or uh, Petersburg or, or, or wherever. That's not the issue. Uh, the issue is, can you attack some of the bases from uh, from where the aircraft take off? And that, if you could, that that would help. Where I mean, Ukraine has already attacked these bases, yeah. but with its own drones. And, and if you do that, you push the aircraft back a bit. That means you've got more warning. It makes, means that they take longer to reach their targets. They need more fuel. Uh, uh, in their tanks, that means it's less for, for ordin less weight for ordnance and so on. Uh, so that's the, that's the advantage, and it's also complicated by the fact that the Americans did agree after the car the, the sort of mini offensive Russia tried um, uh, so, some weeks ago in, in Kharkiv, um, where you know, the Ukrainians could see him gathering, uh, but weren't able to attack, and that now they'd be able to attack. But um, so the, the Americans have relented a bit. I say, my, my view is, is that um, the Americans have just overthought this. It, it, it's, we all understand where, where, where the risks of escalation are. Um, and, and the main risk of escalation, about which the Russians have always been perfectly clear, is if NATO troops are fighting side by side with Ukraine. And even then, it's not, not altogether clear why uh, starting World War Three is a is a serious response to that, as, mm. but nonetheless, that that is a threat Russia has made and one which m most NATO countries would respect. Uh, but uh, you know, attacks on air bases and, and various targets in Russia are now taking place on a regular basis, mm. and the British, uh, I think the French have said, you know, they're really okay, but 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 this has to be a move that's done with the Americans. Uh, uh, and you know there are proposals uh, that have been made to Biden, but he sat on them. He, you know, I think it's just one of these fixed ideas that he's got. So, and that may loosen up. You know, it, you know, going back to the earlier conversation, um, uh, possibly of President Harris, but certainly even a President Trump, if he feels annoyed and cross uh, with Putin for, for thwarting his wonderful peace plan then this is one way he can show his cross. Mm. Now, on the battlefield situation more broadly, Laurie, last year the term stalemate was being thrown around rather freely, including by Ukraine's most senior soldier, who was shortly after dismissed by his president. I recall you being a bit uncomfortable with that term. How would you characterise the battlefield situation right now? I should come to the term stalemate because I don't like bad analogies. And a stalemate in chess is the end of the game. Uh, it's 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 not a it's not a long term deadlock. Um, uh, uh, so I just I, I'd rather have better language. Um, but the, but the, the basic idea that um, it's which is how you started, which is very hard to find a way um, to win this war with a with a combat offensive, with a land offensive, is. Um, is probably there. It doesn't mean to say it can't happen. Um, you know, even if you look at the front at the moment, I mean, the, the Ukrainians have fought incredibly bravely uh, and, and hard against a almost continual Russian push, uh, certainly since late last year. Uh, and the Russians have taken bits and pieces, and they've taken kilometers, um, but not tens of hundreds of kilometers. 
Um, <laughs> but when, you know, they made, the, the, the day they, they were able to make one breakthrough, because it was a rotation of, of Ukrainian forces, they had decent intelligence, and they, and, they, and they pushed through. And those sort of things could happen. The problem for the Russians um, is they don't have the combat power to exploit it. They've just exhausted mm -hmm. their forces. So they just keep on sending people to the front with horrendous casualties. I and mean, whether the numbers that we see are correct, I, I wouldn't care to say them. I, I think that was I'm, yeah. I, I think that was published in the Economist, right? Did that shock you? Those numbers? No, because these numbers have been around uh, for a while, and the, the Economist numbers were actually um, more reliably based. Um, but the Ukrainian and the UK Ministry of Defence use use high numbers, and I'm not saying they're wrong, um, but you know, it, it, it's not an exact science. Mm -hmm. But they're high. And, and there's enough uh, telegram posts from uh, miserable Russian soldiers at the front to give some credibility to these reports of Russian uh, soldiers that, are, that are feel neglected, the wounded aren't looked after, the morale is low, they're not properly fed, uh, and they're pushed forward into meat assaults, uh, which don't achieve very much. I mean, the, the, the breakthroughs for Russia, and this goes back to the issue of being able to attack bases and better air defences, tend to come from um, glide bombs and they're massive explosions that just batter holes in, in Ukrainian defences. So um, it, it's uh, the Ukrainians uh, have held on in, in, in a way I said, that, that goes beyond what I thought they'd be able to achieve given that the, the, um, uh, the American and quite a bit of European aid had been trickling through. And some of that should improve for the Ukrainians uh, over the coming months as production increases, including in, in Europe, new okay. shells are coming through, the ammunition, drone manufacturers is extraordinary. But there's a constant back and forth on this with electronic warfare, jamming and so on. Uh, and I wrote about it in, in the little book. And that'll continue. But it's always possible that something goes wrong. Um, I mean, the, the Russians got themselves caught in Kharkiv uh, in September, August, September 2022. Um, and those sort of things can happen again. I just don't think uh, the the Russians have got the capacity to really have a sort of dramatic surge forward. Um, they just as soon as they're in the open, every, every side is vulnerable. And I think this is the problem of, that we're learning about modern warfare from this: is that concentrating forces is really very dangerous. Uh, all forces have to be kept dispersed. And it's very difficult to mount offensive in those two, in the, in those ways. So you're looking as much to the, just the sort of collapse of a defence as much as sort of a strong defence being uh, broken through. Now, your reference to the glide bombs there brings me to my penultimate question, which is, have you seen any important Ukrainian or Russian battlefield innovations over the last year? You know, innovating all the time. I mean, the use of drones and the integration of drones with fire and command um, is, is pretty impressive. And the ability to sort of saturate areas so that it's, it's almost impossible to move without being spotted is, uh, is genuinely innovative. We know less, or at least I know less, about um, some of the innovations in electronic warfare and so on. But that is requiring a lot of rethinking because uh, you have to think of different ways of navigating to target. Uh, and again, there's quite a bit of innovation going in there. So it's, it, it's incremental, but it's moved an awful long way, certainly over the last two years. Um, and obviously, you need training to go with it. Uh, but... You know, the Ukrainians have shown themselves to be pretty savvy as well. And the Russians adapt. I mean, you, know, you see it on both sides. And if you've got uh, the sufficiently professional, competent engineers around, this sort of thing can be done. So I think you're seeing a lot of the innovation in those areas. Um, other than that, you know, the, conceptually, it's the same as, it, you know, as it's been in, in the world wars. It's, it's what what both sides are trying to do will be fully understood by 
the generals from those wars. It's it's not um, it, it's not a completely new form of warfare. And the new forms of warfare we were you know we were expecting of cyber and amazing information campaigns. They've been tried, but mm. haven't had the same sort of impact. A lot of Russian cyber is now devoted not to infrastructure in, in Ukraine, but you know, the battlefield and trying to interfere with um, Ukrainian communications and so on. So I don't think it's um, uh, it, 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 it's high tech in many ways, but very traditional. So final question, Laurie, and here's where I call for uh, some humility uh, on your part, because what I want to ask you, I, I know you've already said in the past, and I think written that the, the biggest shock of this war is the fact that Putin launched it in the first place. You were expecting right to the yeah. very end that it would never happen. Other than that, what have you gotten wrong? What have you changed your mind about over the course of the war? <laughs> um, I don't think it wouldn't happen. I just didn't think it would. I mean, I, I, you know, on the balance of probabilities, I thought he would, it was a stupid thing to do. Indeed, it was. Um, but I always thought it, that you couldn't have that many troops gathering around Ukraine and it not being possible. I think what I, I mean, to be honest, which um, sounds not humble at all. I, I haven't been surprised by an awful lot over the last year and a half. What I think I, I got wrong um, in the um, in late well, summer, autumn 2022 is I got pretty optimistic on the Ukrainian side. It seemed to me they were winning and the Russians were losing. And I think that was true at the time. The Russians were being forced back uh, embarrassed, um, and then in September, late September 2022, uh, Putin doubled down. He didn't have to, but he did. Mm. Uh, and from that point on, that point where I became more pessimistic, not necessarily on the battlefield side. It took a while uh, on that, but I just couldn't see, as we discussed earlier, where the peace came from because Putin had made it more difficult for himself to back down. Um, I think. It took a while to appreciate the extent to which the Russians have sort of re re reinforced themselves. Um, I was, I was, unlike others, I was always anxious, I think, about the Ukrainian offensive last year. I mean, I'd hoped it would go better than it did. Um, but you know, looking back at what I wrote, I don't, again, I think. Uh, I, I could see the problems of, of pushing through defences. And, um, you know, we now, there's lots of post-mortems on what went wrong there, uh, some of which I don't think I, I, I appreciated, but others I did. And then I think probably I got very pessimistic in February, March. Um, I probably could have been a little bit more optimistic then. Uh, but it's moved, you know. Mm. I mean, I think it's, when a war goes on this this long, it's um, you, you learn quite a bit about the, the, the competing forces and strengths and weaknesses and where, where the breakthroughs come. What's hard to get right is uh, the changing politics, um, and uh, which is why what I since I got wrong in February twenty-two and September twenty-two in some ways, um, and why I'm very cautious about predicting what Putin will do uh, over the coming year. But I still think the onus is on Russia to find a way. Um, they're the ones who've got to make the biggest concessions now because they're the ones that are illegally occupying uh, another country's territory. And I, and I think one thing that I did get right um, is because this is a war as clear as any in terms of right and wrong in international law and the Charter of the UN and so on and so forth. Uh, I didn't think great fatigue would set in um, on the European side, and it hasn't. And it didn't hasn't really on the American side. Still very strong public support. It's just the, the peculiarities of congressional politics that, that held things up, and now peculiarities of presidential politics. So, um, you know, the support isn't as much as Ukraine would like, and, and, and we've discussed areas where they feel thwarted and frustrated, and, and stuff has come through too slowly for them, and it's taken a while for us to build up our protective capacities again, and so on. So the, the, 
you know, it's not it's not a hundred percent marked to the uh, to the Allies at all. But they've hung in there, and Ukraine's hung in there. And you know, every time people talk about winning or losing, you've got to remember that Russia's four times the size, uh, and it still hasn't worked. Well, Laurie, wonderful to speak with you, even on such a dark subject. Thank you for your time today. Always good to talk to you. Take care. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.